Hi, I'm Margaret Martin at Melio Guide. I'm a registered physiotherapist. Melio Guide is all about aging well with exercise with a special focus on osteoporosis. Today, my special guest is Dr. Janet Rubin. She's a distinguished professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at the University of North Carolina. She's also vice chair of research in the Department of Medicine. On top of all these things, she maintains a clinical practice helping people with their osteoporosis. Dr. Rubin has been investigating bone remodeling for decades. Her particular focus has been on how exercise and mechanical forces affect cell cytoskeleton and how that stimulation alters the stem cell lineage, what they become. So Dr. Janet Rubin, has not only accomplished all of these things, but she's also been voted by her peers onto the list of best doctors in America, a recognition that she's held since 2008. In today's discussion, Dr. Rubin explains bone remodeling so that you as listeners can better understand the role of pharmaceuticals in bone remodeling and osteoporosis. And so where does pharmaceuticals come in? in regards to bone remodeling? So as I, as I mentioned earlier, pharmaceuticals, the, you know, the, uh, the list of drugs that I as an endocrinologist will use, some of them inhibit osteoclasts. So that would be standard first line therapy, the bisphosphonates, prolia has become a big, you know, a well used agent. Those inhibit resorption or osteoclasts. And there are now two classes of drugs that stimulate bone formation. One is the parathyroid hormone-like drugs. And in the United States, we have two selections. And there's the newer drug, that's, uh, which, in, which is romozuzumab. Um, and that is um, that both inhibits resorption and stimulates bone formation. Drugs like estrogen are kind of in the middle. So estrogen at very high doses does induce bone formation, but we're not putting people on those kind of doses. So it's largely kind of a, I think, holds bones in, uh, in equilibrium. And so Estrogen, if you have a person with very low bone mineral density, estrogen is, is very well shown to prevent fractures, but it will not, you're not going to get bone increases in bone density out of it like you are with the other pharmaceuticals that we use. Um, other things that, you know, that come up are, are things like the blood pressure drug hydrochlorothiazide, and that would be used in people who have a calcium leak in their kidneys, a much, kind of a more complicated diagnosis, but you can improve bone density by keeping that calcium from leaking out of the kidneys with, with, this, uh, with this drug. You know, there are all sorts of other things in the, you know, that probably your people don't want to know about. Those are kind of the, the, the standard ones that we use. And, and of course, there are lots of secondary osteoporoses um, that you have later on a list that we might need to treat hyperparathyroidism before we're going to control of, you know, of bone density. So other things, if you're a man who has no testosterone, um, we might want to, you know, replace testosterone. Um, you know, you brought in the emphasis of, you know, that, that estrogen at the level that it's sometimes given is good for maintaining or preventing fractures. So now that's talking about bone quality. And when we get into, you know, the bisphosphonates and the other medication, a lot of people, and myself included, um, you know, will will be concerned about the quality of bone. But I was doing some recent reading and it seems like my preconceived um, thoughts on bone quality really had to do with the early bisphosphonates. And I was seeing atypical fractures because people had been on bisphosphonates for 25 years. And so if you don't mind just maybe 
you know, segue into oh. why people don't have to be so concerned um, because the whole prescription for bisphosphonates has changed dramatically. And my understanding is they're way more powerful than they used to be. So the dosage so has changed. I think that question is probably a lot of the patients that get referred to me from their primary care providers who are tearing out their hair because the patient just won't do this, you know, won't go on a bisphosphonate. So you're correct that in the early 90s, um, etidronate was the first bisphosphonate that came out of, uh, out of Switzerland. Um, and it was associated with perhaps uh, uh, bad bone quality. Now, the bisphosphonates that we've been using since Fosamax really got sorted out in the 90s of last century, if they were associated with bad bone, then people wouldn't have fracture prevention. I mean, come on, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Why would doctors throw something out at a host of people who haven't had fractures if we're gonna cause fractures? So we don't. And initially when I remember being, I was young then, you know, like, wow, this is gonna change remodeling. What happens if people have a fracture? You know, is it gonna make them not able to heal their fracture? That was the first thing that we were asking and it didn't, people were able to heal fractures and we can give those drugs immediately after a hip fracture and not have problems with healing. Now, what happened was that these drugs seemed so very safe that people just got put on them and stayed on them. And that is where the problem comes. So let me walk you through that. So. When I tell patients my goal, unless you're very old, which is when you're getting into your mid eighties, and I'm sorry for those that we're all gonna, if we're lucky, we're all gonna be that old. But in the 65 to 85, that's 20 years of great life. What happens with the bisphosphonates is after you've been on them for, depending on what your target is, where you're trying to get, you don't get decreased risk as you stay on them. And if you are taken off them a holiday, you have this period where you're still protected, then bone mineral density starts to fall again. So you go off your holiday, nobody stays on holiday forever and you restart. So the adverse effects, and I think you're referring to the subtrochanteric fracture, the atypical femur fracture, which instead of being the typical, very common fracture of the hip neck, is a fracture under in the, in the long part of the femur. Um, that, uh, that happens in my experience in two, and, and we have a lot of data on it now, even though it's very rare, so the risk for that builds with the years that you're on the drug. So the risk really starts increasing at about four years. I usually have most of my patients into holiday by that time. And when I say most, that's not my difficult patients or my very old patients. So you go on a holiday and then the, the big data sets from the, from the National Health Services of Scandinavian countries suggest that after a year, your, um, your risk almost goes back to normal and you start as kind of a virgin side effects person when you restart the drug. So that is my goal with my, with my young olds I'm a young old, 65 to 75 is young old. Um, and my middle old, 75 to 85, is to get you to holiday. Now, the, all the anti-resorptive drugs have the same side effect profile. So denosumab, which is called Prolia in the United States, I don't know what it's called in, in Canada. So Prolia has kind of an evolving profile. It, it, it has the same side effects as, um, as the bisphosphonates, but as it continues, and there's a lot of data on this now, there's starting to be a suggestion that after the first five years, when it runs kind of head to head with preventing fractures with the bisphosphonates, 
that five plus years, there may be more fracture prevention with the, with the denosumab, with the every six month dosing. So I have a tendency to take my older ladies who are becoming frail, which I know we're gonna talk about later in this interview, and I'm worried enough about them that I might leave them on denosumab because I'm looking for, as they really get old and frail, what can I do with them? So I use all these drugs differently depending on who you are coming in and what your needs are and what you look like, right? If you look like you're gonna live way into your 90s, and you know, you, you don't want your patients thinking that, but if, you know, if I look and I say, you look really great, you know, live a long time. How am I gonna keep you from fracturing? Because over 50, untreated, half of women are gonna have, you know, fragility fractures. Now, if they all tromped around and exercised and did all the things that you and I want them to do, are we gonna prevent them from having fragility fractures? No. I mean, it's, it's very hard to measure after years and years. People have fragility fractures because they get so old. So how can we best do this? I think the drugs that we use in people um, have real, really decreased fractures. Um, I could flip this off and say, most of my ladies on drugs in their 70s and early 80s, they just don't have fractures. And we know that's where they fracture. So I understand when you're saying, you know, you're very old, you know, you're, you know, 85. old, old. The old, old, sorry, <laughs> better term. Um, you know, and having dealt with individuals who were prematurely taken off of polia and, you know, the very terrible side effects that, you know, were first identified in Europe and kind of not, you know, paid attention to here for too long, which has, has made people even more leery of, you know, the truthfulness of drug companies. And so my, you know, I totally get where you're, you're like, if they're in the old, old category, why would you take them off of it? But there's so many people in the young old and the pre-young old, you know, in their 50s that are being suggested to go on prolia, but we don't know how to take people off of it. So, off so, I, so I, I think that's not quite true. So, so first okay. of all, there are very few people in their 50s who should be on drugs you know, unless they have a fracture, unless they have a, you know, a secondary illness that, that makes them very prone to this because people really don't start fracturing until they're into their 60s. So if you met me in the grocery store and you said, hey, I know you're an osteoporosis doctor, when should I get my first, you know, uh, density exam? And I'll usually say, you're probably okay to get it 64, 65. Um, you know, but I don't know that person, right? But to start treating people really early, we can improve bone mineral density, but we don't improve efficacy of fracturing because they don't fracture. So to segue from that to your real question, so Prolia, we do know how to take people off it, I think. They get two years of a bisphosphonate so they can get to a holiday. The problem is, and, and I don't see this as the drug company, you know, falsifying information at all. It takes a long time to figure these things out, right? I mean, bones take long, you know, take years to turn over. And in a thing that progresses slowly like this, it's not like you have a cancer drug and somebody's going to be dead in six months and you throw all these things and you find out all the side effects. This is a slow moving target. So the denosumab is, you know, it should be used by people who know what they're doing because you cannot take people off denosumab. You have to roll them off it or they have to understand that when you put them on it, you're staying on it for life. For instance, a patient with kidney failure, right? Somebody who's on dialysis, those people, this is probably is the only drug that they can take pretty much when their kidney function doesn't work at all. So you have to sit there with your patient and you say, 
these are your risks, this is what I'm worried about, and it's a difficult subject, but when we decide to put you on Prolia, that's it for you. You're staying on this drug. So you have to have a doctor who knows what they're doing. So I have clients that are being suggested or have already started on the Nusimab, which is Prolia here in Canada, before the age of 65. So that's one thing. So, you know, the, my understanding in the studies and also in some of the clients that their bones, they might not get the multiple vertebral fractures, which is some of my clients got because they were not segued into a bisphosphonate, um, but their bone density just dropped right back down. That's correct. Um, so, so then you kind of go, well, what was the benefit, I guess maybe they were a little more protected for those two years. Um, so they are protected during those two years, but they are at higher risk for fractures when you stop denosumab, period. Yeah. And we all know that. And Margaret, we've known that for a bunch of years now. And it just shocks me that everybody doesn't know it. I've known it for, I don't know, five years um, that we would never uh, you know, you would just never stop denosumab. Mm. And, and I, I think a, one of the risk for denosumab is patients who have breast cancer and they're on bone agents to prevent um, skeletal adverse of effects of the tumor growing in their bones or trying to keep it out of there. And the cancer doctors don't get this. And that this is gonna be, I think, a big problem in the future because these breast cancer ladies are living a very long time and they come off this agent and the docs, they just don't know about it. And it's, I think gonna be an issue, but it's not, you know, medicine is hard and, and everybody can't know everything. So it's, it's hard to say, you know, I blame my doctor, or I blame the drug company it's nice if the patient is thoughtful. I hope that more cancer doctors learn about this. Um, but, you know, we, ha we have so many more things that we can do to help patients. I mean, it's just an explosion of things we can do, but we can't know everything the minute we start. Okay. So, I need to, I'm going to bypass a few questions that I had and go into one I have for later. So when individuals are being suggested prolia and they're under the age of 65, should they turn to their GP and say, I would like to see a specialist? Yes. And okay. So yes. that would, okay. So simply, okay. Very good. Um, and then um, those, okay, for the, because many people listening to this are on polio and they're under the age of 65 and they've been on it for a few years. And your cancer scenario was, I, I can think of two of my clients exactly like that. And when they were being told to be put on it, I was like, who am I to say, you know, I'm a physio. Um, so if they had had the opportunity, you know, to speak to you, at this point, or if they, you know, what would be your advice to them? So, you know, every patient is their own cells. There is no patient who's like another person and all our clinical outcome studies are not on that patient. They're on a group of people. So as a doctor, you have, and a physiotherapist, you have to look at each patient and say, what are the risks? What is my goal for you? How am I going to get you there? Am I going to, am I going to temporize? Am I going to hold you somewhere? Where are we going? So there, the thing about Prolia is it's really a pretty safe drug. It builds bone mineral density much faster than the bisphosphonates do and continues to do that. So I think there's this kind of push to put people on it. But you have to think about what you're, why you're doing that, especially in a young woman. And I have a few patients on denosumab 
but generally in the very young, if you see somebody with extraordinarily low bone mineral density, there may be other things that you should be doing besides prolia. But again, it's a, you know, these ladies should be seeing, in my opinion, specialists. Maybe not everybody can, but then they can ask you. <laughs> so for me, when a woman is menstruating and cycling, I don't want to know her bone mineral density unless she fractures and I need to look into it because she's already on a great agent and that's estrogen. Why would I add anything to that? We have, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in the 90s, when we found out that the bisphosphonates were great drugs, a lot of women in the postmenopausal transition were put on these drugs. But they didn't stop fractures because the women in general weren't having fractures. So if you think about this, this is not like you walk into my office, you have hypertension and I lower your blood pressure. These are people who have nothing wrong with them. They're normal people. I don't like to medicalize them. Also being put on the drugs, they seem many times, my experiences, the drugs haven't been very effective because what you're really seeing is they're kind of losing bone and they're kind of retaining bone because they're on a drug. So who even knows what you're doing? When you get ladies later on, so you know if you're in your early 60s and you're fracturing, then yeah, come and see me. I'm gonna treat you. But most people, you can look at all the curves, they're available on so many publications. Fractures really, except for wrist fractures, which I can't quite figure out, they don't start until you're in your 60s. And you can prevent them when you're in your 60s. So that's when you need to start paying attention to them. I mean, you know that someday you're going to die of something, but you're not going to start treating yourself when you're a kid. You treat, you know, when you get closer to that event. In terms of exercising and nutrition, I would say to you, you should be doing it anyway. Exercise is a no brainer. So if we could spend a few minutes talking about something that so many people um, raise concern to, to me is they don't want to take a pharmaceutical drug because of the side effects, that fear of what if. And so this is your domain. If you don't mind sharing, you know, what it is about, what the, what the percentage risk is, um, you know, how often do you see it? This is, you know, this is what you live and breathe. Okay, um, so the side effects for the most commonly used um, anti-osteoporosis drugs are for the bisphosphonates and for prolia. Those are the, the most, most common, the first line um, drugs are the first is bisphosphonate and then uh, prolia. Um, the side effects are very rare rare enough that it's a little hard to calculate them, but it's anywhere from one to five in 100,000 patient years. So, I mean, come on. So, but it does happen. So the, the side effects aside from, you know, GI stuff, which, you know, maybe, it, maybe it's true and maybe it's not, if you're taking it orally, there are two side effects. One is the dreaded osteonecrosis of the jaw and the other is the atypical fracture, not the hip fracture, but the subtrochanter femur fracture. And they're both bad because nobody wants to sit in a dentist's office and get their teeth scraped. I see very little ONJ, osteonecrosis of the jaw. I probably, in my practice, and again, please understand that I'm not going to clinic every day. I have a clinic once a week. Um, I see very, very little of it. The two people that I've seen with it was a surprise um, made on a biopsy and these people had toruses or these kind of gross in their, you know, which are bony gross in their mouth, which are pretty common, it turns out. And it may be that because of the, the way the, the, the mucous membranes lie over that, that they're more susceptible. It may be because of my patient population, you know, the triangle area is very highly educated, you know, take care of their teeth, whatever. But I don't worry about that. And the dentist should not make 
that a consideration of what they need to do. You know, and it's something that happens when you pull out teeth. If you got to pull out the teeth, pull them out. All right. Try to do one at a time, not all of them. So the second thing that I have seen is this is the atypical femur fracture. And again, it's so rare that it's very hard to study. There is probably some genetic basis for it. Um, you know, some way that people are in ways that we can't tell, turn over their bones differently. But certainly the rate of seeing this appears to have gone down since we started doing holidays in people. And I told you at one part in this conversation that um, we try to get everybody to a holiday who we can. And if we get them to a holiday, it seems like the amount of these subtrochanteric fractures have gone down in the past 10 years than what you could look at before. The problem with these fractures is that they're poorly coded in the hospitals. So there's, you know, the coding for them might be incorrect and you don't know, is this a, an anti-resorptive related fracture? These fractures did happen before bisphosphonates. Um, so it's a little unclear. Now, um, I have seen these fractures because they get referred to me. Um, and they are not pretty, but neither is a hip fracture. So I try to think in terms of what is the risk for a hip fracture versus one of these fractures. And it's something like, if you look at all of them, 100 per one. So I, I'm, you know, by the time I've treated somebody and, and reduced their hip fracture rate by 50 to 60% or maybe even more if they have a really big increase in their bone mineral density, that of those 40 fractures, you might not like the math that I'm doing on this, but of those 40 fractures that I'm still going to have, even though I'm treating them, one of them might be one of these kind of fractures. But I hope that if I put the patient on a holiday and then I am going to have to restart because they're going to keep getting older. So someday I'm going to have to restart that I will have brought them back down to start them fresh in building up for their fracture. Okay. May I just, in terms of the osteonecrosis of the jaw, just having spoke to a Canadian doctor recently about that in terms of denusumab. Um, so it's nice to get another perspective. So his suggestion for individuals to reduce the risk was to have, if you know that you're going to have some um, extraction or other oral work done, to wait to the five and a half month point, two weeks prior to your next injection, so that you can have that, you know, plan for the dental work to happen at that point, so that you then can maybe delay the de next denusumab shot by two weeks. So you have a month. Yeah, with I mean, six of one, half a dozen of the other. I mean, okay. it's an interesting idea. I think that healing of, especially in these people who need their teeth pulled out, I don't think that healing happens in the, you know, in that one month period. But I, it probably wouldn't hurt. Um, you know, I... I just don't, I don't see a lot of it. it. We all know that there's more periodontitis as women get older. It's one of the things that goes along with aging and you have to take care of that. Um, but as I said, my experience with osteonecrosis of the jaw is very small. I, I've seen much more um, trochanteric fractures, which no, I mean, I hate them. What, what, what can I say? It's there, you know, nobody wants a fracture. Okay. And then, so I'm just going to finish that first thought, but um, therefore, would you even put any value into, you know, the year that you're on a drug holiday or two years that you're on a drug holiday, that in that time period that you can really, you know, go and see your dentist and make yeah, sure. Sure. That sure. I mean, you know, you should all dentists want us to see them twice a year. Um, you should always be seeing your dentist and, you know, confer with them. But if you're, if you know, you're going on a holiday and you know, you have to have teeth extracted, sure, do it. You know, um, 
you know, the bisphosphonates mates stay around a long time, mm-hmm. uh, fortunately for us. Um, so some ladies have no bone resorption four years later. And so there's, you know, they're also this thing, well, you're four years out, you still haven't lost any bone density. Do I need to restart you? And some people are, I need to restart you. It's been four years and you're, you're old. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I just don't know. Um, that's what being a doctor is like. There are risks um, in everything that we do. Uh, and, you, you know, I mean, nowadays you can't even go outside without a mask on. So we all know about risk. 